The Jews have a name for hubris and it's called chutzpah. The Story of the Jews by historian Simon Shama explores the epic journey of a people from antiquity to modern day Israel. The two books and accompanying five part television series were personal for the award winning writer, filmmaker, and teacher. If you're trying to exquisitely balance conservative, liberal, black, white, a, a Palestinian and Jew, you were going to kind of suck the oxygen out of the whole adventure. Shama's produced documentaries and books during a career that can attest to the breadth of his passions and his profound curiosity, including one that examined America's greatness and its flaws. I'm not, uh, I'm not a pacifist. I don't believe in the dismantling, heaven for fan, of American military power, but you have to think, you have to improvise. I spoke to Shama at the historic Sixth and I Synagogue in Washington, D.C. Simon Shama, welcome to talk to Al Jazeera. Pleasure. Now, <laughs> to write the story of the Jews, uh, to write the story of 57 plus 100 years of right. memory among a people who hold very fast to their memories. The it's, Jews have a name for hubris and it's called chutzpah. Well, think, actually, yeah. it's a daunting task. Yeah even for the best of historians, what made you want to take it on? When the BBC said we would actually like to do the story of the Jews, I thought, you know, how many years have you got left? You can't not do this, partly because Jewish history for people who are not Jewish tends to be so overwhelmingly dominated by the Holocaust and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And those are not incidental historical events. They still rightly exercise the world. But they, in some ways, kind of close off the accessibility of Jewish history, which is such a rich and complicated and not always horribly tearful story, as one might imagine. So I thought, well, here's the possibility in Europe and I think even a possibility in the United States to provide a point of access for non-Jews as well as Jews um, to actually enter this story which has had such a profound impact on Were them. there new discoveries? When I began the research five years ago or so, um, didn't really know about the story with which I begin the book, namely a colony, a, a town of Jewish mercenary soldiers and customs guards at the time of the Persian Empire, the 5th century BC. In other words, the time that a lot of the Bible was being written, there was this extraordinary town in a place called Elephantini and an island on the Nile opposite Aswan, in which the Jews shared space with Syrians and Egyptians and um, were, knew some of their story. It was a wonderful paradox that they're celebrating Passover, which talks about leaving Egypt, but they're not going anywhere. I didn't want to start in the mists of time with Abraham. Here is what I call a, a community of suburban ordinariness in a way. Um, because they're not just soldiers, they're there with their families. It's like Fort something or other, you know. It's a real, real town, and we know about the things that are daily life things. We know about their property disputes. Jews are obsessed with that. We know about prenup arguments, those kinds of things. So slightly mischievously, I wanted to say, look, this is a place where there was no obligation to suffer. And also, they were very connected in the non-Jewish world of which they were part. Then I moved to the Bible. The Bible, for all its riches, is not a document of social history. It doesn't really tell us what day to day. This place in Egypt does. It also helps you reclaim, uh, very interestingly, in the last several decades, there's been some talk in the United States about, quote unquote, tough Jews. The idea of the Starker, the neighborhood uh, tough guy. Exactly. Well, at least in the Elephantine, the idea they have mercenary soldiers. Right. The people would say, oh, I need mercenary soldiers. Get me some yes. Jews. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Call the <laughs> Jews. It turns out there were, in 18th century London, which I'm writing about now, there was similarly Gan and Roughnecks, actually. Um, they, it was the Sephardi Jews who brought fish and chips to Britain, actually, believe it or not, from the Mediterranean world. Apart from actually eating and selling fish and chips, they were kind of debt enforcers, really. There was a kind of, you know, Jewish soprano gang, basically. And they, so there, I, I don't, and I actually wrote an essay about the first great sports celebrity in, I think, the history, who was a Jewish boxer called Daniel Mendoza, known as Mendoza the Jew, who was a very, very tough, 
and devious fighter. He invented the uppercut, we're told, actually. And he was attacked by Christian boxers, as being typically a Jew would always hit you from down below up top. <laughs> so there is this side to our existence, as well as you say, the studious philosophers and poets and uh, men of the mind. Time and again, you bring us back to scholars and readers and writers because here's this culture at the collision of three continents that is not a culture of images and statues and idols and objects, but of ideas and words, words so precious that they're carried around like idols and, right. and sacred objects. Right, exactly. No, I mean, that, that uh, extraordinary substitution of something which doesn't have a human face attached to it or a body attached to it, like Greek and Mesopotamian and Egyptian deities, but is actually simply a, a combination of, it's essentially laws, ethical norms, in the, accompanied by stories and how they got to be in the world. Egyptian religion, when you think about it, depended critically on vast, colossal, fixed statues and inscriptions. And the genius of the Jews, perhaps in adversity, exactly as you say, Ray, was to make it portable, to make this writing in a scroll form or in a miniaturized form, something you could carry with you. So whatever the usual markers of your power and identity were, an army, a temple, a building, there was something you could take with you which would survive. You know, there are no more Lydians, there are no more right. Medes, there are no more Illyrians and Babylonians, but there are still Jews who are contemporaries of all those people. Why are they alone among those people? No more Phoenicians, but there are Jews. You know, there are Jews who disappeared, Chinese Jews disappeared, and they disappeared in circumstances where they were really quite well treated and melted. I'm not, this is not a recipe saying persecute us. I do not want to be uh, uh, misunderstood that you need a dose of persecution in order really to have a sense of your identity. Otherwise, you know, there'd be no American Jews. Even if you're not strictly fiercely orthodox, you commit yourselves to a community of memory. Were there any religion which um, both in the Bible and every year at Passover are required to remember and to relate a story so that it doesn't disappear generation to generation. And um, the Jews are not at all unique in terms of what they've suffered as being treated as permanent aliens and strangers, but they are probably unique in believing you can do this through the power of the word and the power of the mind, I think, actually. And you use the word we. And this is an interesting moment for a historian because, you know, you're not a German romantic poet, you're not a 19th century abolitionist, you've entered the world of a lot of different people right. as a historian does. Mm -hmm. You try to see their world. How do you do it when you are of the people you're writing about as yeah. well as learning about the people you're writing about? Well, it's true, and we all, I think, in growing up in the 1960s as baby historians, we, most of us took a self-denying oath. That's to say, we would, even if, we, even if there was we were British historians writing about British history, which at that time I didn't do, you accepted the fact that they were unlike you in time and place. They were kind of incommensurably strange. The past is a foreign country. And you, therefore, you had no illusions that you were walking and talking among the dead. It struck me a long time ago when I was writing about the French Revolution that the virtues of, you know, chilly distance, I'm loading it really, the virtues of distance and objectivity um, can be oversold. That's to say, when I, when I thought I wanted to do the French Revolution book, I went back to read the histories that had been written in 1889 by generations who were only like two or three generations out from what had happened. And what you got from there was the kind of just an afterburn of an event the perils and the tumults of which are being caused by a kind of feverish intoxication with dangerous words. I felt that both in a book writing, but especially in a television series, if you're looking for a kind of place of safety, if you're trying to exquisitely balance one view and the other, on camera, conservative, liberal, black, white, a, a Palestinian and Jew, you were gonna kind of suck the oxygen out of the whole adventure, really. So I did sort of take a deep breath and say, fine, this will be without too much autobiography. But occasionally there's a wink in the pages of the book, uh, a wink yeah. to the reader because you'll deliver a, a, 
a set of ideas, and then um, Groucho Marx steps in from stage <laughs> right and, and throws in a, a little bit of a line. Oh, I'm allowed this because it's a shtick as well as a book. I never said that. I think it was, I think if, you know, it happened when it happened. I begin the book with a story of two parents worrying about their soldier boy son in the place we talked about in Egypt. And the father has failed to get him his kit and his back pay as he promised. And the father, we only have the letter from the father, and the father is very shifty about failing his son, who's obviously going into dangerous territory. And he starts to do exactly what Jewish boys know, Jewish fathers do, so he's not feeling so well. <laughs> the implication being, don't give me a hard time. And then I say, and then come at the end of this letter, you know, so many thousands of years old, from 475 BC, the three words from which all Jewish history is spring, likewise your mother, against which there is no arguments. You always have to be wary that you're not kind of embarrassingly and creepily throwing modern dress on people who truly would not know how to wear it or modern forms of speech. But equally, you want to acknowledge when it's something that strikes you profoundly across the centuries as being of their time and all time. I'm with Simon Sharma on Talk to Al Jazeera. When we come back, we'll take a look at American power in the 21st century and the current problems in Ukraine and Crimea. Only on Al Jazeera America. I live that character. Go one on one with America's movers and shakers. We will be able to see change. Gripping, inspiring, entertaining. <laughs> no topic off limits. I'm like, Dad, there are hookers in this house. <laughs> Exclusive conversations you won't find anywhere else. These are very vivid human stories. If you have an agenda with people, you sometimes don't see the truth. To watch new episodes of Talk to Al Jazeera, check your local listings or visit aljazeera.com. Welcome back to Talk to Al Jazeera. I'm with historian, documentarian Simon Shama. He's got a new book called The Story of the Jews. Simon, we're sitting in this glorious early 20th century temple, right. uh, which had been an African Methodist Episcopal church for half a century as that. neighborhoods in Washington uh, changed and now um, redesigned, reclaimed as, as Jewish space. The cornerstone of this building, laid in 1906, has memorial objects put into it, the minutes of the first board of trustees of the temple and that sort of thing, and the U.S. Constitution. Uh, and okay. I thought that was such a touching thing yes. because this has been, this country has been a haven for Jews, a, often a difficult home, but arguably one of the greatest right. gifts to the Jewish people Absolutely. ever. You know, Jews come to Newport, they come to um, New Amsterdam, where they run into Dutch anti-Semites immediately, um, one of them at least, Peter Stuyvesant, the governor, but they also come to Newport in the middle of the 17th century. And Newport is significant in Rhode Island because actually Providence Colony um, is founded by Roger Williams. And Roger Williams is a kind of fierce Christian of the kind of radical, in 17th century terms, left. But his view is that there is no church that is not corrupt and imperfect. Therefore, no good Christian is ever entitled to form a government and not entitled to bar anybody else's worship. That includes, that includes American Indians and it certainly includes the Jews. And there's an incredible spark of fire of toleration that begins in New England, you know, and, and Roger Williams is himself a refugee from persecution from Puritan Massachusetts. But the crucial big point to make, Ray, I guess, is that Jews have had a hard time when nations and nation states have founded themselves on myths about soil, blood, and tribe. We are wanderers. We are never going to make people feel easy if essentially they are aiming to have a country built out of territory and one language and the sense in which you belong to an exclusive tribe to which people have to conform almost biologically. You know, the, uh, the world now is still fighting those terrible battles. America is truly special because it's founded on an idea. That's, it's the ideological and philosophical equivalent of a formless God. 
in other words, you know. It's again the, the only great country in the world that it also is formed out of words. So the, mu the union, the communion between American words and Jewish words is a natural and surprising meeting. And it re remains to this day absolutely unique. So it's not surprising um, that, 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 that the possibility of existing outside your own boundaries in the Holy Land, in Israel, or whatever, existing as part of other people from other cultures, with other memories, with other languages, who united in committing themselves to these extraordinarily noble words represented by the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution came about. You've written a lot about America, the American future. You've also done TV around right. it. Um, looked at America at uh, the beginning of the 21st century. But now you're an insider and an outsider. Right. Uh, how does the country look to you now? One thing that America has trouble with is a sense of limits. Um, America was not founded on calculating um, limits, really, actually. Um, and I'm thinking in the, American, America, in the American future, you kindly refer to, there's a chapter called American Plenty and a film, which we, this was filmed in the year of the first Obama election in 2008. And um, there, this year, as, you know, um, those years ago, um, the, the essential drive to remain special in the world and to, you know, keep a national community um, as driven by its extraordinary sense of creativity and determination and self-motivation depends also on a calculation of what you can't do as well as what you can do. This is not an election winner, of course, actually, all has to say. Um, but the same thing would be true of, you know, the irrational exuberance of the money markets, really, which got us into such catastrophic trouble. There is no limit to what we can do with derivative trading or, you know, um, that, that cannot be true. Um, so we're wrestling with this dialogue um, between a kind of political language which says that's capitulationism, that's for the Europeans, that's for these sorry addicts of government regulation always telling you what not to do. We are American and we can do absolutely anything. And on the other hand, a gentleman is saying, no, we actually are all knitted together in this world, God help us. There are some things we have to calculate that possibly we can't do or we do with a more modest sense of what our horizons are. Well, there's a baby in the bathwater problem there because part well, of the American genius, I would argue, is that that sense of no limits drives you to do amazing things that nobody else thinks you can do. But then there's a sort of rigid reality or a limit to money that can be conjured out of thin air. Well, I think the way you project your military power, and again, you know, this is the moment we're talking on a dangerous day, I'm not, uh, I'm not a pacifist. I don't believe in the dismantling, heaven for fan, of American military power. But you have to think, you have to improvise. I mean, partly, the, you know, if Benjamin Franklin walks among us with his infinitely brilliant adaptability by seeing, you know, being, being very conscious of um, not being behind the curve, of seeing what the limits to an old way of doing things are, so you can have a particularly adaptive genius. Those who don't have that adaptive genius will go the way, dare I say it, of IBM or something. <laughs> Remember, we all used to have big blue computers, right? That's what happens. So we have to think, as Americans brilliantly do, more nimbly, more cleverly, rather than just assume that the whole world is our oyster. But isn't the tough balancing act uh, doing that without giving into declinism? Um, when the president tried to rally uh, the international yeah. community in Libya and then again in Syria, and now with at least more partners and more support in Ukraine and Crimea, you're seeing a different kind of projection of power. You can't just simply speak power into being in no, the way you, you used to. You can't, but you can't run away from it either. Is it tricky? It's unbelievably tricky. It's the most tricky thing of all, I think, really. And for all his faults, there was a way he didn't have to cope with the sort of catastrophic recession or we've just barely pulled out of. But Bill Clinton did have a way, um, as did Franklin Roosevelt, um, you know, even his way Ronald Reagan did too. They all had a way, actually, of saying, um, 
what could be done in a new way without, uh, without sounding um, stentorian and depressing. That was the problem. Jimmy Carter had very important things to say, but it was appallingly hopeless. The way he said it was just making everybody feel naughty and wicked and having to stand in the corner for their sins. Look, we're at a very, very serious moment today since you brought it up. And it struck me this morning, thinking about it, that you know, whatever happens as a response to the possible annexation of Crimea, there is a gigantic issue out there which America is supremely fitted to lead, namely the definition of what free Europe is. This sounds a little cold warrior for me, and I couldn't be less of a cold warrior, but we need to say, we need to make it absolutely clear to the Russians that the days of reconstructing the Soviet empire are gone, that there is such a thing as a free Europe now. We need to worry about where its borders are, but we need to do this. Americans, be it the Atlantic Charter, be it the Declaration of Independence, be it the Gettysburg Address, are very, very good at pithily articulated uh, statements of principle which the world immediately understands. There are probably some people picking up a paper, turning on this broadcast, um, hearing about it on the radio, and thinking, why is this my fight? Why is whether Crimea is Russia or Ukraine my fight? It turns out, unexpectedly, that the great issue of our time is how do people of different beliefs and different cultures share the same common space. And if the answer to that, to problems about sharing a common space, is you invade a part of a country um, in order to sort out problems with minorities, you're in an unbelievably, suddenly, violently dangerous world. And we have, us, after all, along with Russia, in this particular case, we are signatories to a treaty. They gave up nuclear weapons in order to be guaranteed the, the territorial integrity of Ukraine. If that paper is worthless, we are truly in a 1930s situation in which none of the countries who feel close to a potentially expansionist Russia are going to feel safe. The Baltic countries are going to want to have their nuclear weapons. The Scandinavian countries, you know, all, all those countries that used to be part of the long reach of the Soviet Union into Europe are going to say we cannot possibly rely on American power. So the answer to our commuter in Duluth and San Antonio is to say, if you believe that America is not just simply about our parochial shared interests in the Western Hemisphere. But, you know, we, whether we like it or not, we've been saddled with this global role, which in some sense the world has benefited by an American presence, unimaginably so, since the Second World War. Then this is a moment to, you know, stand up for what we believe. It's a moment to step up to the plate. I'm talking with historian Simon Sharma. You're watching Talk to Al Jazeera. Stay with us. A lot of people at first blush who are hearing you talk about your latest book may not realize it's only sort of the first of two yes, massive tomes. Yes. Are you going to land that plane on the deck of the aircraft carrier? You say you're still writing <laughs> parts of the story. I mean, it's you're, Jewish you've mission to, accomplished. Yeah, right. I mean, you've got to. Got I don't know, my dear. Stay tuned. I am writing as fast as I can. But I, it, it, it turns out, who knew the Jews got around a lot in the modern world? You are, as they say, a man of many parts, um, not just sitting with piles of dusty notes and, and scribbling away. You like to sing. You like to dance. If I uh, happen I like to cook. I think I think a lot of people who sort of work with their heads and with writing need some, some sort of break from it and something that's really... And in my case, you know, I'm a very impractical person. I wouldn't know a carburetor if it fell on me from the sky. 
Um, I was not great at various kinds of sport, but I knew instantly when I started to cook seriously as a student that I could do it. There was something about smell, flavor, the chemistry of it, timing. Um, There's a bit of performance to that too. There's a lot of performance to it. You, you're giving pleasure and you're, there are a lot of antics. I've had more emails, my recipe for a mustardy cheese souffle. I've had actually more than any history I've ever done. <laughs> Sharma's cheese souffle is why I was put on this earth, it turns out to be the case. So some, some uh, archivist, uh, hence, centuries <laughs> hence, may know you for that. They will know me as souffle Sharma, yes. The story of the Jews, Simon Sharma, great to talk to you. You too, thank you.